Hello, all. Thank you for joining us for the first session of the RSET webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing for Scenario-Based Eco Forecasting. My name is Amber McCollum, and I will be your instructor today. For this course, we will have four one-hour sessions each Thursday in September at 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll have lectures followed by a short um, question and answer session. We will also have multiple guest speakers from the USGS North Central Climate Center um, in weeks two through four, and we're really excited about um, having them with us. This course will likely be a precursor to an in-person advanced training to be held in the winter or the springtime. So check back on the RSET website for um, those details. You can find all the course materials at the website listed here. This includes uh, the recordings, presentation materials, and links to homework. We will also eventually have each of our presentation materials available in Spanish. If there are any additional questions um, after our Q&A session, you can email myself or my colleague Cindy Schmidt at the email address listed here. We will have two homework assignments, um, and they will be available after sessions two and sessions four. And they will be submitted via Google Forms. The first link will be available uh, during the session for next week. To receive credit for your homework assignments, you have to submit all your answers via Google Forms um, by September 28th for the first homework and by October 12th for the second homework. Um, to receive a certificate of completion, you have to attend three out of four of the live webinars and complete the homework. And it takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of this course. There's one prerequisite for this course. You should um, know and understand the fundamentals of remote sensing. So you can um, watch our on-demand course listed here, which includes uh, two one-hour recorded webinars that you can watch on your own time. As I mentioned previously, you can access all the course materials at the website here. Um, a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation is available in both English and Spanish, and you can also access those PDFs in the um, handouts uh, icon on your um, web browser right now. In order to view the recordings after each session, you have to register. And once you register for the, to view the recording, you'll be automatically taken to view them. Um, but this just helps us keep track of who is uh, viewing our, our webinars each week. So here's an overview of the general course agenda. This week we'll be providing an overview of ecological forecasting, and um, I'll be talking about some of the products that we will um, eventually be able to use within scenario planning. So this week, uh, I first will give a brief introduction about the RSET program, and then talk a little bit about scenario planning. Then we'll discuss various land cover products available that can be used for scenario planning. Um, and these include things like phenology, burn severity, tree mortality. And then I'll talk a little bit about some land cover uh, data access and tools such as appears and earth data search. So first, as we often do, uh, I'll just provide a brief overview of, of RSET. The Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Program. Our goal is to increase the utility of Earth science data for applied resource management professionals, policymakers, and regulatory agencies. RSET conducts these types of online webinars, as well as in-person trainings in the focus areas of disasters, land management, health and air quality, and water resources. The, the team for RSET, we're located at multiple NASA centers. Um, I'm at the um, Ames Center in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. Um, and we all have backgrounds 
that are specific to the area in which we teach. ARSA has completed over 80 trainings since it began in 2009 and has reached thousands of participants globally. So the figure here shows the geographic distribution of our participants. So we've had over 8,000 um, participants, um, actually over 11,000 now, um, in over uh, 2,500 organizations in uh, 150 countries. So our online trainings are really important for our international audience, especially in regions where there's little in-situ data or in-person resources available. So we uh, try to engage a really large community with a highly varied audience that has a need for remote sensing, but that might not know how to access it or incorporate it into current workflow. There are multiple levels of training that we conduct uh, from the fundamentals, such as the prerequisite for this course, to basic trainings like this one. And then also we have advanced trainings where um, for the advanced trainings we often have exercises and we show you how to download the data and you're actually working with the data specifically. Um, and these can be online or in person. At the bottom here you can see um, a couple of examples of training that we've conducted for each of these levels. All of the previous RSET webinars are freely available to view on the website. You can search by a specific topic area or view all of the webinars um, like what's shown here. In order to view the past recordings, you will need to enter your registration information as I mentioned, and then you'll be taken directly to them. Okay, so first uh, let's start off with uh, providing a, just a brief introduction to scenario planning. So I wanted to start off with a few definitions of some terms that will be important um, throughout this webinar series. Scenario planning is a structured way to think about the future. The central idea of scenario planning is to consider a variety of possible futures that include uncertainties in a system. So many different disciplines use this approach, but what we'll be focusing on is how it's used in ecological forecasting. And specifically, ecological forecasting predicts how ecosystems will change in the future in response to environmental factors. The scenario planning approach is often used in species ecological niche modeling, which defines a set of current and future conditions necessary for species survival and reproduction. Those conditions can be external, such as environmental conditions, or internal, such as density dependency. So scenario planning in this webinar series will focus uh, primarily on those external conditions necessary for species survival. Species distribution models follow the ecological niche approach by assessing the suitability of habitat for species. The models use raster-based layers such as land cover, elevation, etc as predictors of suitable habitat. The predictor data is combined with either presence or absence data of species abundance in empirical statistical models. So what we will really focus on is describing some of these models in this webinar series in the later um, sessions. But this week, uh, the primary focus will be the sources of these types of predictor variables that can be used within these models. This is a list of some typical predictor variables for species distribution modeling. And these include things like land cover, vegetation indices, burn severity, tree mortality, topography, and climatology. So I'll describe some of the sources of land cover and um, vegetation products that can be obtained through um, remote sensing. So now we will um, jump into some of these land cover products that can be used. There are several existing land cover products, including the National Land Cover Database, or NLCD, 
the GAP Analysis Program, or GAP, and the lands Landscape Fire and Resource Management Planning Tools, or Land Fire. And these are for the United States. For global coverage, there are things like MODIS land cover products, the FAO Global Land Cover, and the, the ESA, or the European Space Agency, Climate Change Initiative Land Cover. The NLCD products include land cover type, percent impervious surface, and percent tree canopy cover at a 30 meter spatial resolution. And again, these are for the US. The database is available for 1992, 2001, 2006, and 2011, and is created using a 16 class classification scheme. The database is primarily based on Landsat data, along with other data sources such as topography, census data, agricultural statistics, um, soil characteristics, wetlands, and other land cover maps. The data are freely available at the website listed here. Land Fire is a shared program between the USDA Forest Service and the Department of the Interior. Again, this is United States um, focused. This program provides landscape scale geospatial products that are designed to support cross-boundary planning, management, and operations. This site includes multiple data types for a variety of areas, and it's not limited only to remote sensely, remotely sensed data. You can also find research and publications relevant to um, these types of application areas. The Gap Analysis Program, it represents uh, detailed data on vegetation and land use patterns in the United States, and this includes Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. This national data set combines detailed land cover data generated by Gap with land fire data. The sources for land cover data are all use similar base satellite imagery, classification systems, and mapping methodologies. And this allows for the creation of a seamless national land cover map at 30 meter spatial resolution. The vegetation classes are based on NatureServe's ecological systems classification, which describes vegetation communities at a finer level of thematic detail than what has been previously mapped for the US. Data are available for viewing and downloading from GAP's ecosystem viewer which includes vegetation range maps and descriptions for each of the seven tiered levels of vegetation. So here's uh, what the USGS um, GAP land cover data viewer looks like. Here you can visualize and download data by state and county or by landscape conservation cooperative. So in this example, I just selected the state of California, and then I can click on the bot at the buttons at the bottom to get a printable map or to download the data directly. Um, so you can use this interface to um, obtain some of um, these land cover information. The MODIS yearly land cover product incorporates five different class classification schemes that describes land cover properties derived from observations spanning a year. And these products are available globally. The primary classifi classification scheme identifies 17 classes defined by the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, or IGBP. And this includes 11 natural vegetation classes, three developed land classes, and three non-vegetated land classes. The data have a spatial resolution of 500 meters. And currently, the um, MODIS version 5 processing has um, ended. 
So the land cover products that are currently available are available only from 2011 to 2013. However, a, a new suite of version 6 um, products are expected to be completed by the end of this year. So you can download these products um, from NASA's uh, Earth Data website, which I will talk a little bit about um, this Earth Data Search website later on in the lecture. So this image shows the MODIS Global Land Cover products with the 17 different land cover classes. Note that it has five different classes for different types of forests. You can download the MODIS land cover product through NASA Earth, the Earth Data Search web portal. And so this is an example of what, it, what this looks like. And I'll be demonstrating a few of the features um, with Earth, Earth Data Search uh, later on in um, the lecture here. The FAO Global Land Cover Share Database provides a set of major thematic land cover layers resulting from a combination of the best available high resolution national, regional, or subnational land cover database. These products are produced at a resolution of one kilometer. The data includes 11 land cover classes and is distributed in separate layers in a GeoTIFF format. And they are all available through the FAO um, Geo Network Portal, which is listed here. The FAO also has national and regional land cover data sets for many countries in Africa and the Himalayas. Through its climate change initiative, the European Space Agency, or the ESA, produces annual global land cover time series data from 1992 to 2015. And these are available at a spatial resolution of 300 meters. The effort was supported by processing data from different satellite missions. Um, so the, some of the sources are listed here, and these include NOAA's AVHRR, SPOT, NVSAT, and Probe of V. The data include 22 land cover classes based on the UN land cover classification system. So you can visualize and download these data using the um, CCI land cover viewer. So here's what that um, CCI land cover viewer looks like. On the left, you can see that there are various land cover types, including percent cover of tree cover. You can select the year you want along the top of the screen, and you can also get graphs that include greenness, snow, and by a pixel-based description, and then you can obtain um, something like a CSV file, or you can download a raster layer that you can then import into some kind of geospatial software. Um, directly for um, additional analysis. Okay, now uh, we'll talk a little bit about access energy and how it can be used in uh, your modeling as well. So phenology is the study of the timing of biological events in plants and animals such as flowering, leaving, and hibernation. Plant phenology is the annual dynamic of vegetation greenness. So this is um, like the green up and the green down. Vegetation indices from satellite imagery, such as the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, and the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI, can be used to monitor phenology in plants. So as you recall, and as you know from um, understanding the fundamentals of remote sensing, when sunlight strikes plant leaves, the chlorophyll in those leaves strongly absorbs visible light in blue and red. And the cell structure of the leaves reflects green and strongly reflects near-infrared light. So that's portrayed on this graphic shown here on the left. 
In the graphic on the right, you can um, see the spectral signature of a um, general vegetation, um, vegetative plant. So the two key wavelengths that we use for um, NDVI are the red, shown with this dip here um, in the uh, reflectance, and the near infrared, where we see uh, a strong spike in the reflectance in these common um, ve uh, vegetation signatures. So NDVI is this relationship between the near infrared and the red wavelengths. And the formula is specified here. The values of NDVI for an individual pixel range from negative 1 to 1. Any pixel between negative 1 and 0 means that no vegetation exists. And a pixel close to 1 indicates the highest possible density of green leaves. The picture on the right shows that healthy green vegetation absorbs most of the visible, of the visible light. Here, only about 8% is reflected. And it reflects a large portion of the near-infrared light. So here, um, close to 50% is reflected. Mm -hmm. Unhealthy, sparse, or senescing vegetation reflects more visible light. So you can see here that 30% is reflected. But it reflects less near-infrared light. So only 40% is reflected. So the, you can see the resulting differences in the NDVI values in um, the values below each of these images. So the green vegetation has a value closer to 1. Here it's um, 0.72. And the brown vegetation has a value closer to 0. Here it's 0 0.41 as an example. The Enhanced Vegetation Index, or the EVI, is just another vegetation index that's available from the, the MODA sensor. So you can actually download this as a, as a product. The NDVI is more chlorophyll sensitive, while the EVI is more responsive to canopy structure variations, um, including things like leaf area index and canopy type. One issue with the NDVI is that it saturates in regions where there's really high biomass. So the EVI was developed to optimize the vegetation signal. Um, so it has improved sensitivity in these high biomass regions, so these really dense forest regions. Um, and it also has a reduction in um, So you can actually download these as a standard product um, from MODIS at various spatial resolutions, um, like 500 meters and one kilometer. Um, but the formula is also um, shown here for how the EVI is calculated. Plant phenology is the annual dynamic of vegetation greenness, and so it can be tracked using these vegetation indices. In the graph um, on the right, you can see the progression of vegetation dynamics in the season of change. In the figure on the left, you can show that you can see the differences in NDVI in winter and summer. So early in the year, which is the winter, there are no leaves um, on the trees, resulting in these low NDVI values. But then when spring arrives, the vegetation greens up and NDVI increases until it peaks in the summer. Then the vegetation senesces and loses those leaves and the NDVI declines. So you can see those differences clearly identified in um, these winter versus summer um, images. Both MODIS and VIRS both have um, phenology products available for download. And you can download those through the Earth Data Search, which I mentioned previously. Um, there are multiple spatial resolutions, but the most commonly used is the 500 meter. And um, these 500 meter resolution images are produced annually. They uh, both primarily use the EVI. The MODIS version 5 is currently available, and version 6 
along with the uh, Veers Phenology product. Those will be coming really soon. So next we will discuss burn severity, which is another type of um, factor you can look at when developing your, um, your models. Burn severity is the effect of a fire on ecosystem properties. And this is often defined by the degree of mortality in vegetation. It's the degree to which a site has been altered or disrupted by fire and is loosely the product of the intensity and the residence time. Fire intensity is the amount of energy or heat released per unit time or area and it encompasses several specific types of fire intensity measures. And the residence time is how long the fire burns for. And fires can really uh, drastically affect ecosystems and can be used as an input to scenario models. So we can use remotely sensed imagery to assess the effects of fire on ecosystems. So how do we really connect these pixels uh, in a satellite image to burn severity? As we saw when we talked a little bit about the phenology, healthy vegetation has this characteristic spectral signature. And this is shown in the figure here in green. You can also see characteristic signatures for things like dry bare soil in brown and clear water in blue. In a similar approach to the NDVI, the differences in the spectral signatures can be used to map fires. Imagery collected over a forest in a pre-fire condition will have um, very high near-infrared band values and very low mid-infrared band values. Imagery collected over a forest after a fire will have low near-infrared and high mid-infrared. So here you can see um, typical signatures of low and high burn severity. And these are shown with high in red, moderate in yellow, and low in blue. And these are compared to a relatively healthy or unburned vegetation in green. So you can see that as the severity of the fire increases, this spectral signature deviates more from what you would observe in healthy vegetation. And these differences are what's really important for us to be able to map burn severity. So as you can see here, the relationship between these two spectral signatures is exploited to identify severity. The areas where the relationship between the two bands has changed the most are the most likely to be severely burned. The areas where the relationship has changed little are likely to be unburned or just very lightly burned. The best way to do this is to measure the re relationship between these bands prior to the fire and um, then measure them again after the fire. To determine this, analysts perform a, a band ratio between the mid and the near infrared bands. And the result is a classification of burned areas. So the goal here is really to take advantage of these differences in these spectral response curves or spectral signatures and then distinguish them from one another and, and map these locations. So just like the NDVI, we have something called the normalized burn ratio. And it's often used to study disturbance. It's, um, the equation for it here is shown on, on the right. And this is the ratio of the near infrared band to the shortwave infrared band. The NDR takes values ranging between 1 and negative 1. In vegetated areas, it has a positive value. While it's negative, it, it's negative when it corresponds to things like bare soil. In burned areas, NBR values decline at the same time as the fire severity increases. This ratio helps identify where wildfires occurred. And this figure shows the extent of the Rim Fire, which was a fire um, in 2013 that burned um, in Yosemite National Park. 
At the Forest Service, they use this ratio to create a burned area reflectance classification, or BARC. This is a post-fire vegetation conditions map. And this has four classes, high, moderate, low, and unburned. However, to assess severity, what you really need to examine is a N NBR of a pre-fire image, so before the fire occurred in the same location, and then after the fire occurred in the same location. And as you can see here, um, Landsat is really the most commonly used um, satellite for this type of, of analysis. So as I mentioned, to assess burn severity, you need two images. So you'll create a NBR for both images and then subtract the post-fire image from the pre-fire image. And that um, equation is shown here on the right. So here, a higher differenced NBR or DNBR indicates more severe damage. So generally, classes of burn severity are low if they're about 0.1 to 0.27 moderate if they're 0.27 to 0.66, and high if they're greater than 0.66. Typically, NBR and differenced NBR images are generated really shortly after the fire burns to get an initial assessment of burn severity and to support field work. Then during the next growing season, these data sets can be calculated again and then um, used to assess uh, vegetation survival, and maybe even delayed mortality. They can be used in developing emergency re rehabilitation and restoration, and they can be used to estimate um, soil burn severity, and then also look at things like flooding landsides and soil erosion. So this could be included within your, your model to assess the effects of fire on um, ecosystems. The Monitoring Trends in Burn Severity is a project that consistently maps this, um, these types of features that I was just talking about. So it maps burn severity and fire perimeters across the US. They, it's a partnership between the USGS and the USDA Forest Service. So they use multiple data sources, including remotely sensed imagery like Landsat, but they also use in situ data. And they use the um, expertise of individuals who, who know the area to um, create classifications, um, fire perimeter data, and fire perimeter data. Um, so they have these analysis with um, data processing experience and who really know the region to um, generate these uh, burn severity classifications. So these are um, things that you can obtain directly without having to go through the, the process yourself of, of doing those types of calculations. So another um, variable that is often included in these types of models is tree mortality. So we'll discuss um, this a little bit. If an area of tree mortality is large enough, it can be detected by satellites. Sources of existing vegetation mortality or disturbance include things um, like data from Matt Hansen's group, which um, created the Global Forest Watch, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and here, data can be visualized and downloaded um, where forest disturbance is occurring. In the United States, the US Forest Service carried out aerial surveys each year. And um, these data can be found um, on the Forest Service website in uh, readily usable formats um, in a geospatial processing software. Lastly, you can use image processing change detection methods to detect tree mortality for maybe your specific area of interest. So the images here on the right um, show mortality of lodgepole pine in Colorado as part of, um, due to the um, bark bark beetle epidemic um, that occurred. And um, the top image was from 2005, and then the bottom image was from um, 2011. And you can see the areas in, in red uh, in the center here are where um, the uh, trees have died off in this region. So the Global Forest Watch 
is an interactive online forest monitoring and alert system. Um, and it's really designed to empower people um, with the information they need to better manage and conserve forest landscapes. It provides information about the status of forest landscapes. And this includes things like tree cover gain, tree cover loss, um, land cover information, land use, conservation, population density, and country specific data. For the tree cover loss and gain, the uh, Global Forest Watch uses Landsat. So it, it has um, data available at a 30 meter spatial resolution and it provides data from 2001 to 2015. So it shows the location and the amount of disturbance, but not necessarily the cause. So that would be um, something that you would need to um, think more about with a region um, of interest specifically. Um, and it's a really cool, easy to use online tool. And I really love to just play around with all of these layers and, and get an idea of uh, of what's going on in specific regions. So in this example here, what I've just done is zoomed into the um, Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC, to look cl more closely at the area of um, tree cover loss in this country. So if you click on the purple country data tab on the far right, you can actually type in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You can then click on Analyze to obtain specific country metrics. And that will show up on this panel that's shown here on the right. So here you can see that from 2001 to 2015, there was an area of um, over 9 million hectares of forest loss in that country. And that's the um, value indicated there in pink. And then you can also download the data directly from the map viewer. Um, in this, uh, you can see the download data button here at the bottom of this side panel. Um, so then you can analyze it um, on your own and, and have the data for yourself. In the US, the Forest Service collects and reports data on insect, disease, and other types of forest disturbance using um, experts in aircrafts. These experts visually identify the location and the cause of mortality, and then they also draw polygons on handheld devices that can be used within a GIS. Those data are available at the website listed here at the bottom. The image on the right shows the progression of tree mortality in the southern Sierra Nevada from 2014 to 2016 due to um, widespread drought and also to um, beetle infestation in this region. This is an image of the insect and disease survey for 2015 in the US. The pink to red areas show varying levels of tree mortality. So you can see the extensive amount of mortality in the western portion of the US, um, in particularly in the um, southern uh, Sierra Nevada in California. Recent developments in, land, in change detection methods take advantage of these really long-term, um, freely available Landsat archives by using monthly or annual time series to look at changes and to also identify trends. While the previously described me methods, you would only use maybe two image dates, this method you could use 20 or 30 different image dates. And it allows you to capture um, the duration of disturbance events along with long-term disturbance trends. This approach is found in on the this approach is founded on the recognition that change is not simply a comparison between two different points, but rather a continual process operating at both fast and slow rates. So um, could help you identify the difference potentially between a um, large wildfire and maybe slow mortality that occurs due to uh, beetle infestation. There are several different algorithms um, that are used 
And one of them is um, called Landtrender. And this is a, a really useful tool developed by um, some folks at uh, Oregon State University. The results of this algorithm include the magnitude of change that identifies the percent of tree cover loss and the duration of the disturbance and the year of the onset of the disturbance. So you can kind of pull apart um, some of these features that you might not be able to identify very clearly with um, just looking at two different time periods. Um, so this might be something that's really useful for you if uh, you have change occurring over long periods of time um, within your region of interest. Okay, so finally I wanted to provide um, an example of two data access tools um, that can be used for land cover. The application for extracting and exploring analysis ready samples, or APPEARS, is a really newly uh, developed tool by the um, Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC. Um, this is, using this tool, you can download data and analyze it within a um, specific user interface. Data sets that may be particularly relevant for scenario modeling um, are the modus land cover and things like DAMET data, um, which has um, climate conditions. APPEARS also enables users to select data spatially, temporally, and spectrally. And the volume of data downloaded for analysis is really greatly reduced. So two types of sample requests are available. You can identify specific points that you're interested in. And you can do this by using geographic coordinates. Or you can identify area samples using um, different polygons or um, regions of interest that you draw yourself. They have interactive visualizations with summary statistics on the sample results. And these are provided within the application. So you um, can really preview and interpret the data and interact with it before you actually have to download any of the data itself. The primary operational function of APPEARS is the extraction and analysis of point samples. So in the Extract tab, if you have a file of uh, point coordinates, you can upload them um, as a CSV file here. You can then also select the date range. And then you can choose the data type in the search function here. Um, so again, as I mentioned, they have a lot of the same layers that you can obtain from the standard LPDOC website, such as um, fire locations, modus land cover, um, land surface temperature, uh, a variety of different things that you can select and include and compare. You can then view the data visualization as time, seri time series plots in um, this output visualizations. So here we have an example of modus land surface temperature data. With these plots, you can stack data, zoom into specific time periods, and conduct simple correlation analysis between different types of layers. You can also save your searches and then easily access those files uh, and figures at a later date. A new function that's still in, in beta, um, but it should be released soon, um, is the use of area samples to conduct those same types of analysis. So here you can select a larger area file, such as a, um, you can use a shape file, or you can draw your own polygon. You can then, um, and so that's where you do that here. You can then again select your date range of interest, and then your data product of interest in the same way. You can also select a specific projection um, and data type here. So you can um, download the output from this analysis as a GeoTIFF and then open it within some kind of geospatial software. Once the processing is complete, you will have three options available. You can view the data and interact with the results. You can, um, like you can see here on these figures here on the right, 
And these are examples of a percent tree cover from MODIS in Rwanda. You can also see the distribution of tree cover over multiple years um, in these box plots along the bottom. So there are various ways to visualize the data results. Um, and again, this is something that's brand new and it's just coming out. So um, there, there are a lot of possibilities here, I think, with um, some of this initial analysis before you download it and start to use it within your, your modeling. So another, as I mentioned before, um, the Earth Data Search um, is another useful resource. And um, a useful imagery layer to obtain for scenario modeling is a yearly land cover data set. And so, as I mentioned, you can obtain this from MODIS and um, as the MCD12Q1. Um, and this is the MODIS yearly land cover product. And the Earth Data Search website is shown here. And again, this is a fairly new tool as well that I really encourage you all to, to take a look at. Once you get to the website, you'll be asked to take a short tour, which, which I really recommend. It, it uh, talks a little bit about all the features available. And you can log in with your Earth Data account um, via the button at the top, or you can create an account. It's free um, for you to join. You just need to register in order to download the data. Using the search function along the top, uh, along the top left here, you can type in the short name, the MCD12Q1, as I've shown here. And then you'll see a list of collections that populate along the bottom pane, shown here. You can then choose a spatial subset using this uh, icon here. You can draw a polygon, um, rectangle, or choose a point. You can also upload a shapefile if you have the, the area of interest. You can then specify a time period. Finally, once you have all, the all of the granules or the um, images that you want, you can download them um, directly here. For most of the download options, you can customize the product where you can download it as GeoTIFF, and you can also specify things like the projection, um, and the uh, layer of interest. Once you click Submit, you'll be taken to a page where the data process will uh, begin immediately and will eventually give you links to download the data directly. Um, you also will receive email updates when the, the data has finished processing. Um, and if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this, we have a recorded demonstration of this tool in our recent drought webinar. So if you go to, the net, go to the RSET website, you can actually view a video that takes you through this type of demo um, if you'd like more information um, on, on this um, tool. So now it looks like we have almost about 10 minutes um, for questions. And I just wanted, uh, again, to tell you that you're free to email us with any follow-up questions that you may have that we can't address here or um, that we may not know right off the top of our heads. So here are the contact emails um, for myself, Amber McCollum, and my colleague, um, Cindy Schmidt. And then if you have general questions about RSET, you can um, email our, our program manager, Anna Pratas, and her email is listed here. And then again, the, the RSET website um, is listed um, for reference. So Thank you all for joining me today. And um, as a reminder, next week we will focus on an overview of climate science and data. And we'll have our um, guest speaker, Helen Sofer, from the USGS Fort Collins Science Center. And again, we're really excited to um, be partnering with the USGS as they are um, really going to be our experts in, in all of the, this scenario modeling um, um, details here. So. Um, thanks again, and um, we will now take um, a few minutes for questions. So if you just type your questions into the question box, we um, are going to display them um, up on the screen here, and then I'll, I'll answer as many as I can. Um, also, if you're interested in connecting with um, any of your colleagues that may be uh, on this webinar, you can type in your name and location organization, email address, 
and uh, we will display those within the um, question box. Um, so, so thank you again, and um, we will be pulling up those questions here momentarily. All right, everyone. So um, I'm just going to go through some of these questions here and answer them as I can. And hopefully you can all see um, we're now displaying this Google document with um, some of the questions here. Um, and there may be some that I skip along the way. And if I do, um, I'll hopefully get back to them. Or you can email them to me later on. And um, we will eventually, hopefully, um, compile these questions and answers um, and put them up on the website. This is kind of a new thing that we're trying out. So we're hoping this will, this will work um, for us a little bit. Um, yeah, the, the first question here is, why are there so many different data sets and thus different classifications? And that's a really good question. And I think that, that really depends on um, the region of interest that's the focus for um, whichever uh, agency is conducting these classifications. Also, um, depending on the data that they're using. And so I'm not um, really super familiar with the reasoning behind why they uh, create these different classifications. But um, it might be useful for you to think about um, your region of interest and um, maybe which classification scheme or which data type um, is focused on that area and, and, and take a look at those. And there are some really commonly used ones, which are the ones I've mentioned here. Um, and it really also might depend on um, your interest and what kinds of designations are made and um, if those designations are uh, informative for you within within your research. So um, that's not a very specific answer, um, but hopefully that helps a little bit for you. Um, the spatial resolution of the FAO data is at uh, one kilometer. Um, so they, they have uh, 11 different classifications um, on their, their portal at a, a resolution of one kilometer. Um, the next question here is, will the ESA create a land cover with Sentinel in the future? Um, I cannot give you a yes or no answer to that. I'm not sure what the ESA will do, but um, I would imagine that they would use Sentinel data for, for conducting those land cover classifications, as it's very similar to um, Landsat here um, that we use at NASA. So, um, if I had to give you a yes or no right now, I would say yes, but I'm not familiar with the, what the ESA is doing in regards to their classification. And again, oh, I wanted to mention too, if anyone on the webinar listening might know the answer to some of these questions better than me, feel free to, to type those into the, the question box and we can share those um, answers with your colleagues as well. Um, because I know that we have a lot of experts here online as well, and they might know some of these answers better than I do even. Oh, this is a really good question. Um, um, talking about high resolution worldview imagery. And is anyone using that for um, land cover? Um, that's a really great question. We have been, um, for another uh, job that I do um, here at NASA, we've been looking at some of the worldview data. and Yes, uh, the spatial resolution is, is uh, much higher um, than Landsat. And if you have data available for your region, it is something that, is, uh, that could be very useful for you. However, you have to think about some of the limitations of commercial um, satellite data are that um, unless you are with a government or tribal organization, you um, have to pay for these data, and um, they are collected on the basis of requests from customers, as far as I understand it. And so there might not be data available in your region for the time period that you are interested in. So it's really a matter of, um, yes, there is the benefit of higher spatial resolution, which might allow you to identify um, different classes of land cover more specifically or um, designate um, these classes with a higher accuracy. However, there are limitations in that the data are not globally freely available and that they might be uh, 
provided at a different kind of temporal resolution uh, in different regions depending on your study area. So um, again, there's always uh, pros and cons to the use of um, NASA data versus commercial data, um, but that's definitely, if you, if you can get the data and um, you have it over multiple time periods in a region, it's, it can be really useful. Um, so the NDVI equation, that's a really good question. Um, so NDVI is essentially a ratio of the red band and the near infrared band. And so um, if you just take a look back at the, uh, at the presentation, the, the formula is on slide 34. And so um, what, what it is is a ratio between the, the, the red being um, subtracted or added from the near infrared. And so this is really that difference between the absorption of the red and the high reflection of the near infrared for vegetation. So we, we obtain a ratio, essentially. So you get a value between negative one and one, where anything below zero means that there's no vegetation. And then as you increase from above zero to one, we um, see the highest density of vegetation when we get a value close to one for the NDVI. Um, I think this next question refers to, uh, oh, okay, I think there was just a little confusion about the version of the, the MODIS data. So there's no gap in the data availability between 2013 and 17. They're just, um, NASA is creating a new version. So with each version of the data release, there are updates to some of the algorithms, things like cloud masking um, is sometimes improved. And so with version six, all of those data will be available. They are, they just haven't released the version six data for, um, for use yet. Um, but those, those data will be available for that time range. So there's not um, necessarily a gap in um, MODIS uh, data availability because MODIS is still um, acquiring imagery. Okay, here's a question about aerial surveys um, in the US if satellites can be used. And this, this sort of goes back to the um, conversation about um, resolution, uh, ver uh, spatial resolution versus temporal resolution, the, the pros and cons of um, things like aerial or high resolution imagery compared to maybe moderate um, satellite imagery. So the aerial surveys, um, when taken over specific locations in the US, often have uh, much higher spatial resolution. So they can identify areas, smaller areas where tree mortality might be occurring. Um, that that might not be um, identifiable by a more um, moderate or coarser resolution satellite imagery um, that you can obtain. So the aerial imagery might be, for example, on a um, might be a meter or submeter pixels, uh, whereas the Landsat imagery, as an example, is 30 meter spatial resolution. So if you have tree mortality occurring in a smaller area than 30 meters, you might not be able to detect it with this, the satellite. So the aerial surveys kind of provide an additional um, um, benefit in terms of um, spatial resolution. However, because they're flying on aircraft, uh, they, they can't get that global uh, resolution on a uh, temporal um, basis. So you, with MODIS, for example, you can uh, get an image nearly every day of the same location, but the resolution is much coarser. Whereas an aerial survey, you have a very specific location, but higher um, resolution. So um, again, pros and cons here um, when looking at, at, at these things. Um, so I know that we have quite a few more questions here. Um, however, we are now at, at our time. And um, so I think maybe what, uh, what we'll do here is uh, we can log these questions and um, we can make notes on, on some of these. And 
if we can come back to these questions if we don't address them um, later on um, in our um, webinar series. Um, so good questions. Uh, I really like all this interaction. And um, maybe at certain points, we'll have, have longer periods for, for some of the Q&A. But um, I, I want to thank you all, again, for, for being here. And um, we look forward to seeing you next week. And we'll focus more on climate data next week um, in our session with our USGS guest speakers. Um, so thanks again. If we didn't get to a question, you um, can feel free to email me any questions that you have. Or we might actually address some of these later on in, in the webinar series. So um, thanks again. And um, we'll talk to you all next week.